Hello, and welcome back to Podcastle in the Sky. In this podcast, we will be looking at two films from 1983. One is Octopussy, which was one of two James Bond films released that year. We will not, however, be looking at the other James Bond film, but we will be looking at another film released in 1983 about a character who was strongly inspired by James Bond. And this film, and the character, is Golgo 13. Specifically, Golgo 13, The Professional, which is the full name of the film. And uh, as for a little introduction to our podcasters, I am William. Those of you who have looked at our Twitter uh, will probably also recognize my handle at VK underscore HM, which is a very catchy handle, which is easy to say in conversational discourse. Um, I'm Amber, uh, and I also go by Sappy Gemstone on the Twitters. Hello, this is Dylan. On Twitter, I am at Dilevolution, all under uh, lowercase. And this is Jesse. I also go by Seraphin. It's uh, spelled how it sounds. I think if you Google me, you'll find my blog really easily. <laughs> and I'm Tom. I don't have an independent Twitter. I just use the uh, the podcast one, but I am probably best boy. So, you know, <laughs> that's what there is. It's not a tough competition. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get this underway. Dylan. Yeah, I, I want to dive right into this because I missed the chance to bitch about stupid, sexy vampires, and <laughs> I just want to, I just want to get into this. You want to you want to bitch about stupid, sexy gentlemen instead? Sexy, exactly. sexy could be old. Uh, sexy is a loosely defined old term. and <laughs> or made of stone. I mean, but they it's... have sex, so that's kind of there's, there's yeah. a lot they're of sex. presented sex. as people who are desirable, although that in itself is kind of a more about the idea of being desirable than being desirable. Yeah, uh, that that yes. <laughs> or something. Okay, so let's just start with the fact that Octopussy, after mm-hmm. a just tremendously dull opening sequence, just made no impression on me whatsoever. Octopussy goes into a song, not a very good Bond song. I like Bond songs, not a very impressive one. It starts us with "All I wanted was a sweet distraction for an hour or two. You know, I really relate to that sentiment after watching that movie. <laughs> yeah. re- that's that's all I asked for, and that movie did not offer it to me. <laughs> and the irony of titling your song All Time High when it's fucking Octopussy, easily one of the lowest points of the Bond franchise to me, is just the, remarkable. The opening scene of Octopussy I actually found hilarious, but I think that's my background in, in all things Russian and Soviet related, so for the uninitiated... <laughs> For the uninitiated, the first scene of Octopussy, it's this briefing sequence, and it's like the, the Politburo or Soviet High Command or something, and they're sitting in this like crescent-shaped table on a oh giant, God. in a <laughs> giant opulent <laughs> marble palace, and their table is on a giant circular hammer and sickle seat, <laughs> yes. which, and the entire seal rotates to look at maps. Uh, and then we have, we have General Gogol, of course. Gogol. Of course. General Gogol, not Brezhnev. Uh, you know, he, he looks like thin, uh, sentient Brezhnev, which by the spirit <laughs> is fat, barely sentient Brezhnev, but it's neither here nor there. Um, and then, and then we have, uh, Orlov, who, now see, I didn't hate this movie, but that was maybe one of the worst performances of the Bond villain ever. Oh, Just, oh my oh god. My god. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's ham, and then there's that. That was that was, was just crazy. awful. That wasn't ham. That was a fucking greasy pork chop. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> so wait, he was supposed to be terrible. the main villain because he was just like kind of like a side villain. I thought. Good lord, he got shot in the back. That's how he got killed. That's that's little, sad yeah. times, guys, <laughs> for Bond villains. <laughs> but yeah, I so that's you, the sequence. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Will. Well, I was going to say, I think he is uh, the main villain basically by default, but that's part of the film struggling with its, its own identity. Like, they'd already decided before they had a plot that the film was going to be called Octopussy. And then the question is, what is this exactly? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah. for starters, it is the only Bond film to ever have the name of a woman as its title. Oh, really? Which is, yeah, really. Uh, and it's one of the main characters. So, is she a villain or not? And they decided... Um, to go with the role that she's not the villain. 
she's just kind of adjacent to the villains. Mm -hmm. And there's some other conspiracy they have to backtrack the film into. She's it's like he's trying to ram together the idea yes. of octopusy with the idea of a Soviet uh, I, problem. All just, I can see... All I can see is like a bunch of dudes in a like a boardroom saying we got to make the new Bond guys. You know who's going to be the girl? And somebody was like, "Let's go with Octopussy," and high fives all around. And then they were like, "Well, how do we build yeah. around this?" <laughs> it was actually it was based uh, very loosely on yeah, one of Ian Fleming's short stories, yeah, oh, which so is it, only it, it only related is titled... to Octopussy's uh, origin. You know, they oh, talk oh. about her father, who Bond plays. Yeah. That's the short story. Oh, that's the short story? And that was the last story Ian Fleming ever wrote about Oh, Bond. so it was mostly alcoholism that caused it. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, the short story that Octopussy is very, very loosely adapted from is part of the book, the short story right. collection Octopus in the Living Daylights, and that yeah. would give us the title of the first Dalton Bond in four years after Octopus Day. Oh, but it's just four years? Because it felt like like a hundred years later, because it's yeah, so that's, different. That's a yeah, that's a completely different feeling of the franchise compared to you know the movies are. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's very much I, I like us. I thought Daylights came out in eighty five, but it turns out that was eighty five was View to a Kill, the last Moore Bond. I did not realize that. Like I thought Dalton started a little earlier. Yeah, no. Hmm. Which Dalton one? Such a short lifespan, and Moore almost didn't do Octopussy. In fact, apparently the main reason they got brought Moore back was because Connery was releasing a film that year. Mm. So Octopussy is a film that really, really wants to prove that it's the better Bond film. And at least in <laughs> oh. terms of finances, it succeeded. It was the more successful film in theaters. But we do have like a 60-year-old man running around, putting on cloud makeup. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. no he's 55. He's 55. Yeah, he's 55. I, mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is I know. The same age. I mean, it's a, it's a battle so of the old man. He's even older right? in view to a kill. Point taken. Oh, God. Jesus Christ, this, this, the way he was, though, in the whole movie was so cartoonish. Am I wrong in oh, actually, thinking that? No, because, no. Oh my okay, gosh. here's, here's um, a list of stuff that happens in Octopussy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so James Bond, he rides around in a crocodile submarine. He <laughs> um, disguises himself as a clown. He dresses as a gorilla. He pretends to be Tarzan. And, uh, <laughs> It, With the, you, the yell from the old yeah, there's the yell. The old movie. Movie. Just, uh, <laughs> yes, and this is all in the movie. Noodle. All yeah. of that is in a big he, blockbuster in the mid eighties. He 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 does a woo woo close up shot of some boobs, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, which which gets to the idea that there's a distinctly thirteen year old mentality about yeah. simultaneously, <laughs> you know. A 13-year-old with all the power in the world and a middle-aged man's fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Both, these Both of these it. movies evoke that very much, so. Uh, yeah. yeah. More, more is dad bond. Oh, <laughs> more dad, bond. dad bond. I know. <laughs> That's a perfect and description. It's the that is the accurate. If, I feel if, like more is he, too dad bond even for people who are into dad bond, though. True. <laughs> but, like, the thing is, the mentality, though, right. is, is perfect. Because it's a, it is. It's like Will said. It's a mix of, like, what a 10-year-old thinks is cool, and also yeah. what, like, a 55-year-old man who looks wow. like, really, he really wants to still be virile and have the hot young things being all like, oh, dad, dad bond. And so he's, <laughs> he's like a huge dork, but he really wants to be cool at the same time. That's that's what late more bond is, mm. for sure. Yeah. I mean, just look I look at the that. scene with Money Penny. Oh, or, you know, oh he and Money God. Penny are both getting on in years. But don't worry, Money Penny is a new assistant. Yeah, yeah you yeah, see the look at her younger. face when Moore leaves. Yeah, the yes. naked longing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He oh my God! He gives carnations, guys. Smooth motherfucker. Oh man. <laughs> Symbolic <thing> flowers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we love the flower symbolism. Oh, yeah. well, we'll be getting to that soon enough. Yeah. Well, Octopus Age, it was just all over the place. I mean, yeah. with all these, like, um, completely ridiculous, like, I don't know what the hell to call them, like, uh, <laughs> gimmicks? There's these ridiculous gimmicks, and then there's uh, a Soviet it's... nuclear holocaust. Yeah. It's a messily plotted, bond on passionless autopilot pile of fucking nonsense. It's... <laughs> they had elephants in the movie because they planned to get elephants in a previous movie and it hadn't worked out. Yeah. Extra elephants on... 
<laughs> yeah, gotta you gotta if you, if you spend the elephant dollars, you gotta use them. Uh, <laughs> you gotta get the money shot of the elephants. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that, no, this is a movie that's at war with itself. Well, I think Will said that, but it's because there's actually there's a few good, like legitimately good action sequences in this movie. The the scene on the train is actually, except for the fucking gorilla costume, um, <laughs> the scene on the train is actually quite good. There's, there's like a shot, uh, where the stuntman, like, jumps over, uh, you know, the train is moving, and there's a, you know, like, water station pipe that's over the top of the train, and the stuntman leaps over it, like, really good stuff. And the, the driving in the late, um, when he's going to the airfield, uh, there's a car chase at the end of the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, really good driving from the police cars. And so there are these good sequences, but, like, everything cool is constantly being undermined by this just, like, ridiculous shit. And I I didn't actually mind it. Like, it's fine. Maybe I've just gotten so used to grim, dark movies, and God, we could talk about Golgo. Um, Yeah. mm, (laughs) That it was like, okay, I can take a little goofiness. Like, it's fine. But it's it's constantly straddling that line between being a little silly and just too much. And you know, Tom, that's completely fair. I found every action scene lifeless as all hell. <laughs> First, yeah. I just... Uh, <laughs> I, this I movie exhausted me. The, uh, uh, like, okay, I've seen Octopussy a number of times thanks to a childhood spent in front of the television on TBS, but... Uh, that last action sequence, that like thirty minutes of Oh just, yeah, they could oh cut my all God. that. So the movie should have ended when uh yeah, when they disarmed the bomb at the airfield. Yeah, yeah. And then like I, um, he's gotta save Octopussy and then he's gotta save her. Yeah, for oh, the yeah, people who haven't yes. God. for people who haven't seen it, um so every time they say octopussy in this movie, I swear to God. Oh the actors must have been <laughs> that's my little octopussy. It's like, oh my that's God, the that best was, line. I wrote that down as uh, that's my little octopusy. Maybe the worst sentence in cinema. <laughs> it's real. It's up there. The it's actors must have just hated themselves every time they had to say it. And then we get event. Not that long after we get that line delivery, we get the shot of the octopus in the fish tank. It's like, oh, oh, of course. Oh, oh, oh. We had to make it into uh, a plot device. But um, by that. for people who haven't seen the movie, so there's a big, uh, what seems like it should be the final sequence. There's a nuclear bomb going to set off, and an American uh, U.S. Air Force uh, air base in West Germany. They disarm it. Seems like it should be at the end of the movie. But one of the villains gets away. Not the Russian, but the, the this other side villain. Um, and so they go back to India. An octopussy who runs a circus performance troupe breaks into his fortress, and it leads to this unfathomably dorky, like twenty five minute action sequence where like octopussy is all female. Um, scantily clad henchwomen take circus instruments like 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 fucking bowling pins and shit, and and go around smacking armed men in the head, and then and then James Bond rides in in a goddamn hot air balloon, and then the Octopussy, as she is in the entire movie, is completely goddamn useless, and so she's like, ah, oh, I've got you now, and then the villain's just like, well, I've got three guys with guns, and she gets kidnapped. Uh, yeah, the the last, like, 25... The plane sequence is actually good, but it didn't matter because I wanted the movie to end by that time anyway. So Yeah, by the, yeah, by the time the plane happened, I was like, oh, my God. Just why? why? <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I was mostly actually entertained by this movie. I did not dislike it. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, the last, like, 25 minutes is like, chop, chop all that out. Get out. I, I'd never seen the movie before, and... By that point, I was very interested in what I had on my phone. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll cop to being you know I'm a youngin relative to the rest of you for the most part. <laughs> um, I had I've watched a couple Conneries and all of the Craig ones except for Spectre. Um, so oh, and Goldeneye. I really like Goldeneye. <laughs> Goldeneye is great. Yeah, Go Gold, Goldeneye is fucking great. Um, mm-hmm. It also is one of the uh, best intros, the oh, song thing, Golden I like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love best. that, all the, you know, Soviet statues, but go yeah. on. Um, so, like, everyone, you know, my, technically my first Bond movie was Quantum of Solace, which, let's not talk oh, about that. Um, no. I mean, the thing is, a lot of the Bond movies are not <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
it it's, might be it's a weirdly it's surprising actually that the yeah. franchise has made it because there is a long stretch of Bond movies that particularly if you didn't see them like a long if you don't have some sort of attachment to them they're just not very good like a lot of the more ones in particular are just dull yeah my point being I'd only seen a handful of the movies up to this point I'd seen Goldfinger and Quantum of Solace technically but I didn't like either of them um and but Casino Royale was really my first. If if it, it is my first Bond movie, the way Goldeneye is for my older brother, like right. Casino Royale means a lot to me. Actually, that movie struck me really hard, and that was like the day before uh, before Skyfall came out. But also uh, by the same director, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so this, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I'm just affected by certain, yeah, from a being from a different generation, from having different expectations. But Octopussy contrasted with Casino. Royale. Oh uh, yeah, well, I mean it's this like is my this bond is peak, peak camp. Dude, I I know that you're uh, younger than us, but are you trying to claim that more is our bond? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> well, if you are going by my knowledge of all of your ages, more should be most of your bond. No, no, no. no. no, no. My How bond? old is that? Old? Old? Here's, no, no. here's uh, Brosnan, I want to be clear. I want to be yeah, clear. Yeah, Pierce Brosnan is my bond. No. Not just because my brother's younger than all of you. Yeah, I just not, not just because he was the one who I watched when I grew up. My first film was actually Tomorrow Never Dies. Mm. Um, mm. Like my also first. because he's the Irish Bond. You know, I remember oh. I went to the same uh, thing that he brought his kids to, the same like little resort in Dublin. I never, I never saw him ever, but I knew he went there. You know, please tell me he doesn't cut out me out of it. No, 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 no. Okay, no. You're, we're listening. Well, I mean, you know, we were just, we were just, we were just respectfully first. listening. Yeah, we were like, he actually did cut out on me. You a were in the, so. we were, you were co- kind of in the presence of. Uh, James Bond there. Yeah. 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 And that, so I, that I'm always going to be very fond of Brosnan, even though yeah. the reality is most of his movies are terrible. Yeah. And he's got Golden <laughs> Eye, and then it's like one long downhill slide after that. Yeah, you know, know. which one was in my dog? I kind of like Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah, I mean, I still like him. It's I mean, Michelle Yeoh. I, I, Richard, Michelle Yeoh. Tomorrow Never uh, Dies and World Is Not Enough have, like, valuable aspects to them. Assemble. Uh, the World Is Not Enough was actually the first Bond film I ever saw in theaters. And I remember being heavily disappointed because Goldeneye was the one that I mm. love, you know. And there's only so much I can, you know, appreciate about that movie when it ends with a line like, I thought Christmas only comes once a year. Oh, you know? God. Okay. <laughs> it, the That's thing with fair. that movie is if you cut out any stretchers, I think it would actually be really well respected as, as a Bond, mm. like in context. But... Her whole character is so t- is really bad. I just think <laughs> the premise of like the journalism conspiracy or whatever is interesting. That is that is world is not enough, right? Or is that tomorrow never dies? I haven't. That's tomorrow. Never tomorrow dies. never dies. Yeah, the the journalism journalism well, they both. My point is both of them. Was, I thought the title was meant to be tomorrow to never lies. You see. Oh. That oh. was considered to be insufficiently bondy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, live and let die, and yeah, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Okay, but um, as far as the different feeling between um. The later bonds, the Dalton and so on in this more one. Um, I do just want to point out that the, um, the actual fisticuffs are so friggin' different that, yes. uh, I mean, I know like, um, uh, more was, uh, 50, 50, mid 50s in this, but, um, if, uh, if you just take, I mean, just remember that, um, Enter, Enter the Dragon was in 1973. It was actually 10 years before this. And that's the one that, that's the movie that basically showed audiences like fight sequences. They don't need to be like Star Trek with John Wayne or something. That uh... good fight choreography and good action choreography have existed prior to this movie. This yeah, movie basically. does not live up to that. But I think it's because of um, the way this um, Bond series works that um, up to Octopussy, and I guess until more left, that um, it was even more conservative and reactionary. That it's afraid of um, afraid of anti-colonialism, afraid of racial awareness, of feminism, and this whole martial arts movie thing. It's part of that. It's part of this whole racial awareness. Part of this whole. I mean, the classic martial arts movie is about the Chinese guy fighting against the white guys, and that's something the Bond series cannot abide. Right. In general, and especially the more ones are famous for their. There's a lot of racial stuff weirdly just kind of sh- tried, they tried to integrate it. 
at the very least, it comes off poorly. Whether it's intentionally like reacting against that, I can't be positive. But I, I think they're just using it as, as kind of a shorthand. I mean, take yeah. how Octopussy treats India. It takes every oh, single stereotype about India you could have read in like a 19th century book mm-hmm. and it puts yeah. it into the movie. Yeah. You have snake charmers. You have people oh who the snake charmer plays the bond of physical theme, pain. I love that. That's the only part of it. Yeah, you, like. you have um, you know, the so-called fakirs, for example, who do the right. pain thing. You even have, and I'm surprised they even tried to put it in, the rope that goes up to nowhere. Uh, yeah. Oh, my Which is God. briefly included uh, <laughs> as something that Q is experimenting on. Uh, why and how is thankfully not addressed because it's such a stupid idea. The guy was, like, in his, the, like, loincloth and everything, too, as he was uh, testing a plot. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the I mean, 1980s, guys. You didn't yeah, this is India in the 1980s. It's not India in the 1880s. Yeah. No, this is kind of an India that never was. It, this film is one thuggy cult away from mm-hmm. full bingo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it was colorful. <laughs> God, they even, I, I, I actually put a note about, it says, oh yeah, here it is. Why is it that India in the 80s had to have gross food? <laughs> yeah, that was a very Temple of Doom moment. Oh yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I think this isn't the worst example of race in Bond. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, I, 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 sure believe me, I was looking. Live and let dies, right? L- live and let die? That was pretty bad. Oh, doesn't <laughs> have anyone in, like, brown face playing in India, as far as I can tell. Yeah. That's a I mean, it's. <laughs> it's all a very. Yeah, it's like a weird. It's like a storybook racism. Like, it's not yeah. malevolent. It's just, what it's, I, it just it's just stupid. It's just, <laughs> like, yeah, it's true. Well, it's, it's, it's really thing. kind of a uh, touristy stuff, basically. This is what you expect yeah. to see in India. This is what we're going to show you. Yeah, 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 casual yeah. exoticism, essentially. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was very. I don't know. It was very much like that. That ch- child's view. Yeah, of the, what yeah, a foreign the, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a foreign. And you know, uh, he, he's got his like. his Indian uh, compatriot who gets killed by a man with a buzz saw on a string or something oh, Jesus. Yeah. everybody everybody even knows about octopussy's like floating palace right like oh yeah there's just there happens to be a floating palace filled with beautiful women you know that's a white thing women, here in india mostly. oh yeah exactly mm-hmm. <laughs> white women looking what does she say white women it's not just white women it's like women who women are, who are looking for girls yeah looking they're for they're basically girls. the female versions of the leads of darjeeling limited turned into oh, yeah. a cult of uh, assassins and diamond thieves or something. Eat, pray, love palace. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Except they all join a circus. <laughs> Eat, pray, this love. Has the weirdest... She trains the f- them. And <laughs> they become viable members of society. I mean, we've been talking a lot about how this movie is the just mix of elements. Like, it's not enough. It's not enough to have... Would you say that the world is not enough? The world is not enough to right. to have a cult of of sexy lady uh, diamond thieves on an Indian <laughs> island. They also have to be full time circus performers. Like why? Why? That's the weirdest element to me because there's like I mean part of this is I think uh, 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 movies like now movies are so demographically targeted, mm. whereas you know in in previous decades like like ah put something in for everybody like. Um, and that so, was a solid movie exec. Yeah, that's my solid movie producer voice. <laughs> um, but there are extended sequences in this that are just circus stuff, and I can't fathom that say the the dads who want to see more Bond give two shits about the dancing bears and and the uh, you know uh, Giorgio the magnificent getting shot out of a cannon, but like. Long sequences of just circus stuff. A really weird movie. Really bizarre. It's culminating in the 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 move. The first scene after the uh, the the theme song kicks in. The first scene after the the whole animated sequence is 009 in clown makeup being right. assassinated. And of course, we have to book it with Roger Moore in clown makeup. Yeah, I, I was never, laughing during that. The canon. <laughs> Oh my god, I was laughing heartily throughout the um, 009 oh. being hunted sequence. And he, he's <laughs> even got the giant shoes and everything. <laughs> he, he, he gets caught because he, one of his balloons caught. <laughs> That's right. 
yeah, it's and it's weird because it's like it's trying to be a serious sequence, but it's trying to be funny at the same time. Yes, it's just it's like very odd. It's a microcosm of all the, the the problems this movie has. It's it's like what are you trying to be? And then and then the final sequence. So we mentioned earlier um, that the the penultimate action sequence um, is is this bomb about to go off at this air force base, and there's a circus performance going off uh, going on at the air force base. Um, and, and so the final sequence is all, uh, Moore is in clown makeup and he's fighting with all the other clowns. And so it's a giant clown brawl trying to disarm the bomb because they think Moore is a spy or something. And so it's like, really? This is the penultimate sequence of your movie? Like you had that amazing sequence on a train earlier and you choose for the climax to be a bunch of clowns beating each other up. You gotta have the clowns. You well, kids love the clowns. So the kids love the clowns. Strange. It's so <laughs> strange. Really odd. Well, every time there's a new Bond film and someone brings up the plot holes, the defenders say, well, every Bond film is nonsensical. It's just something you have to expect, which I don't really see why you have to. Because <laughs> there are actual action movies that with plots that make sense. Yeah. I don't really care about plot holes, but this movie is just baffling. <laughs> it is it's a really strange the, combination of elements. The ideal Bond movie is North by Northwest, mm. you know, which is a Hitchcock Pretty film. Much. Right. About you know, it was years before the first Bond, Cary Grant accidentally stumbles a non existent fictive spy who people believe are real. And he winds up saving the day and stopping people stealing government secrets. And there's action on trains because it's Hitchcock. He loves the trains. And I need to mention Hitchcock in all of this. Of course. I think, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that film doesn't really have a lot of plot holes. It also doesn't have a lot of plot. Yeah. Like, there's a spy well, Yeah, this movie has There's people who wants plot. to get things. Mm -hmm. But what are the government secrets? It just says government secrets. What's the spy agency? Oh, you know, we're one of those alphabet soup things, you know, like yeah. FBI, CIA. We're one of those. Yeah. If you look it's at it that way. Extremely uninterested in its own plot and that makes its plot kind of hard to critique yeah. right whereas yeah, the no. bond films like here we have you know a soviet general with motivations we have octopusy with motivations we have an afghanistan prince who is working with the soviets yeah that's that that no one ever mentions yeah. the afghan I'm, war this is the I'm 1980s really no one mentions that. the war what is going on <laughs> It's I'm, yeah the whole I, i'm kind of confused about okay to be perfectly honest the plot uh I literally didn't know what the fuck was going on until the very end when Moore was like, oh, I see, you're going to blow up a bomb. <laughs> and then I was like, really? Right. That's what this whole movie was? <laughs> yeah, like the, the bomb. Did the Fabergé eggs have anything to do with anything? Uh, yeah, they they yeah. were um, a means of financing this thing while keeping it off the books. They, they financed their secret nuclear war with counterfeit Fabergé eggs. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, you know what? He That's the egg? possibly <laughs> sillier than the clown fight. <laughs> actually, you know what? I um I calculated it, and that one Fabergé egg from the beginning, um, mm -hmm. it was going for the um, equivalent of two billion dollars today, which makes no <laughs> sense at all. I mean, there's no way one art object is worth that much. Well, I, I think that's kind of the point, because, not to defend the movie, but they're using it as a cover. They're not actually interested in it as an art object. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, see, yeah. I thought... I mean, he Wait, accepts so the then, fake Fabergé egg, so... So, Wait, but got, what, Wait, I, I... Okay, so now I'm really confused, so... When yeah. I initially I'm, brought up, I was like, <laughs> oh, it's... Like, I thought it was going to be a North by Northwest thing, where, like, yeah. oh, the Fabergé egg has, you know, the plans or something in it. But then it, it just It does turned actually into have microfilm, but Bond puts it in. Yeah. Yeah. God. And then okay, and then it just so, turns into this weird smuggling ring thing and Yeah, and, wait, wait, wait. So what were the Fabergé eggs not part of the whole getting octopusy really awesome Soviet treasure or what was going on with yeah, the eggs? And uh, I'm completely confused. I, I thought maybe <laughs> I couldn't tell cuz it's really badly explained. I thought maybe, I think the Afghan prince just liked jewels. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think he liked them, and so he didn't care if the Soviets invaded all of Europe in the land war, as long as he had his jewels. But I honestly can't tell you. Wait. That part of the plot was really confusing. <clears throat> to be perfectly because honest, Camille I Cannon barely remember. Because betrays <laughs> Octopussy. So I thought yes. he was doing that because he was working for the Soviets. But, thought... but if he has his own agenda, I don't understand what it is. I, I, actually I think he am... just now wanted just jewels. Because, like, yeah. there's that one scene uh, where the general and, and Khan are meeting. And, and, um, 
and Orlov smashes the fake egg, I think? Yes. He, and, and, Tom, and the other guy, like, he goes, ooh. Like, ooh. like I think he just loves that jewels. wasn't the, But that wasn't the fake egg. That was the real egg. Yeah, I thought that okay. they smashed the, the real egg yeah, and they wound up giving one of the fake eggs to the Soviets to, at the end okay, of the movie. Okay, maybe yeah. you're right. I yes. don't even remember. I, I thought it was a real hateful eight situation. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Topical because reference. He, he, <laughs> well yeah, done, no, no, he like goes ooh, and that was the real egg because that was the one with the the bug yeah. in it, or yeah, yeah right. It was the one with yeah. the bug in it, I and think... I think they put the bug in the real one. Yes, agreed. Because uh, Bond palmed it for reasons unknown. Right. I'm okay. really confused, guys. So... <laughs> palmed it, uh, you know, to kind of cover uh, the situation because if he'd actually won the bid. He didn't have the money to pay for it, so you could say, "I'm not paying for that; it's a fake." Oh, he places I it, get that's, that's his, right. That at least makes sense. That yeah, makes I sense. Also, he gets to have a real, incredibly wealthy thing surreptitiously replaced with a fake, so that's kind of a net gain for the government, anyway. But then it gets sco- smashed. But then it gets smashed, but apparently <laughs> no one notices. Like the Soviets accept the fake; they don't check it. I don't. I don't know why they don't check it. Uh, you see, I am just Are really... we sure it's the real because one? Because they check well, the It doesn't actually matter. Star. Oh, yeah, guys. They check the, the star. <laughs> we're, yeah, uh, we're going to bog that down now. You know, you know, yeah, we should maybe talk about the anime? Because... Yeah. yeah <laughs> okay, actually, does. you know what? Um, I, yeah. I do have something about the anime and uh, and Bond. Okay, so... Awesome. Golgo 13. All right, so... It's this one badass um, hitman, right? He... He's so awesome. Everyone wants him. Every woman wants to be with him. But I don't even see why. Because, like, um, wh- why are people attracted to him? He, he, he is a man of few words. Actually, I think he's a man of like ten words. He's just so <laughs> yes. cool. He's a very ill. In, in fact, character. one of his iconic quotes from the manga is dot dot dot. <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar, means he often says nothing. Yeah. So what yeah. attracts? I think it's like uh, twelve minutes or something into the movie before he has a single line of dialogue. Dude, it's not even just that he's quiet. Like if you look at the sex scenes, he is literally just sitting, laying oh, across God, yeah. Yeah, bed it's, it's, while oh. women are having orgasms oh, over oh his body. Oh my God! Yes, can we talk about <laughs> so... the first sex scene for a second? <laughs> okay, well, yeah. <laughs> like the scene in what's it? Showgirls. It's like the fa- the infamous pool scene in Showgirls, where the woman's just like convulsing ridiculously. Except it wasn't <laughs> intentionally ridiculous. But yeah, it looks just like that. <laughs> no, the one of the biggest laughs I had in the movie is there's there's a shot early on where this gorgeous uh, blonde woman is is I think it's actually cool. Golgo, and it's it's like a close up and like she's like all you know cavorting and kissing him and stuff, and it's just his face. He he never changes his oh expression, God. and so it's he just he doesn't even move. He doesn't touch. No, he her. doesn't move, and he, he's just laying there, and he's just. Stone faced as this woman is on top of him. He is. It's like not. She, and then there's another. I, um, after that, the next morning, uh, and I mean, she turns out to be like tried to kill him later, of course. But but there's a scene uh in the morning before before he leaves, and like she kisses him on the lips, which I think might be one of the. He doesn't like do that much. People kiss him, but he doesn't. Because usually, you know, when you're kissing someone, like both both heads move, but. <laughs> Kissing's extra, ladies. Yeah, no, he just sticks there. <laughs> but so, she's kissing him on the lips, and his eyes are just both open. <laughs> it's this wide shot, and he kissed, and his eyes are just open. And I mean, maybe it's because he's being careful. Visually, it's very funny, mm-hmm. uh, unintentionally. Dude, I just... Yeah, I, I think I, it's... um it. <laughs> The thing that's iconic and memorable about the character is his extreme stoicism. While he was inspired by Bond... He was also based a little, especially in his appearance, on um, actor Ken Taka, um, Takazurika. Or, hang on, sorry, Ten, Ken Takakura. And uh, Ken Takakura played him, actually, in the first live-action film. Uh, so uh, the idea is that he's extremely stoic, he's extremely professional, and Takao Saito, the creator, kind of pushes this to the point of absurdity that he's extremely stoic and professional, all the time. Yeah. He's a man mm-hmm. who does not emote, practically. It yeah, becomes, he's like, been known to emote, but extremely, mm-hmm. extremely rarely. He seems incredibly I think that make, makes the character kind of fascinating to me, because he's kind of like this ur embodiment of uh, professional masculinity. Like, professional masculinity divorced from anything that is recognizably human. Like, Bond right. 
He's a fantasy, but he acts in a way that is, in some senses, relatable. In some senses, oh, right. I would it's probably do different. that. Right. Yeah. The source of the fantasy is very different. Uh, so the, the fantasy is he is takes no shit. He does the job. He does it really well. And he is so goddamn serious, he doesn't say a word. And people love him for it. Everyone oh. loves him for it. It's, it's you know? just, I don't okay. get it. <laughs> I, okay, I, mean, I get Rita doesn't I get just... It. Sleep with them. Rita is in love with them, for example. Yeah, yeah. That's, okay. I don't want. I, don't I want know. You to pay me. I want you to pay me with your dick. Yeah, yeah. That was so great. Like, <laughs> I think I, I I put a note that was basically like bullshit. <laughs> yeah. I thought this part for you, out. but all I want is your penis. <laughs> but that part was crazy again because even in that like little flashback where uh, it's nothing but shadows, he does not move, guys. I mean. It's one thing yeah. not to emote. It's another thing to uh, essentially be just staying still while a woman just, like, I don't know, it's mm-hmm. weird. I mean, for me, this, is a character. this is also kind of the myth of him. Go ahead. That, um, he's really good while staying still. Apparently that's really <laughs> successful. <for him>. Yeah. <laughs> Really? Which is where he gets completely ridiculous. <laughs> it's micro-movements the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I guess his like, shots uh, don't miss. <laughs> that's pretty great I mean I think this is a character that can work perfectly well on the page you can imagine him but visually it just does it's very it, it comes off as looking silly and I mean part of that's maybe just the passage of time but there is ways you can make these kinds of characters work like I thought of some of the Seijun Suzuki movies when I was watching this particularly Youth of the Beast and Tokyo Drifter both of the protagonists in those movies uh, Yakuza movies basically have no internal life. They live for vengeance and honor, and they really, there's nothing to them. And, like, Tokyo Drifter has a romantic component, but so, um, for example, after the protagonist has done his vengeance, like, he explicitly kind of spurns her. Like, he's a hard man doing hard things, doesn't have time for those kind of distractions. And those movies are great, but they're not great because of those characters who are just shells. But the movies are so stylistically interesting and so inventive that it carries them. Or, like, I'm a big Schwarzenegger guy, or, really, like, to a lesser extent, Stallone. Those guys, like, you know, uh, Commando is not a, it's not a great character study, but, but <laughs> Schwarzenegger has so much raw charisma, like, it carries it, like, it's great. Um, or, to go to a more recent example, uh, say, like, the Dread movie, you know, Dread, you know, he's just the Carl Urban one or the Sloan one. The the Carl Urban one, not the Sloan one. Um, you know, he's oh yeah, the Hello. ultimate. He's the ultimate embodiment of just stoicism, but he he has that side character that provides the human kind of uh, you know conduit into the story. And so, there's different ways you can make this work with a character that's just pure stoicism, but it needs to be like really inventive uh, in some way outside of that in terms of the action or something, or you need to have, like, a side character that can sort of uh, put a little humanity into the movie. And that's, for me, you know, is uh, Golgo was just either absurd or just kind of dull. Like, there, you need something to, like, carry you through this experience, and it just wasn't really there. Because, I mean, what, even though this movie, we're comparing it to Bond, it, it reminded me more of something, like, the Death Wish movies. <laughs> like, um. The Death Wish movies if he was just on a payroll. Yeah. 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 Very like, similar. Yeah, not plot wise, but, um. Like, atmosphere. Just, yeah. yeah, just. And I mean, besides Death with Death Wish 3, which is so stupid, it becomes a little bit sublime. But the other Death Wish movies are just. They're just kind of dour mm. and shitty. And that's kind of what this reminded me of. Like, it's mm. just. Like grim, dark, and and dull. So. Well, um, I would say in some senses, um, because of the distinction of having watched all the Golgo thirteen anime, which is not as impressive as it sounds, as it consists of this movie, one OVA, and one fifty-plus episode TV series. I chose Jesus. this because it's Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. Well, anyway, I chose this because fifty-plus episodes. I'm sorry, I just have to no. Walk so it's back. like fifty-two episodes. You know, it's not. Why it's not do that you? Much. Why do you why? do this to yourself? How? I, wow. Because I'm, I again, I'm fascinated by the I'm fascinated by the ridiculousness of the character. I mean, the, the, he doesn't move. How can he exactly. not go? He I have to see move. where this goes. You know, 
I, I just I have feel certain, like I just, affinity for I schlock. Felt this movie. I, I, I think you have a certain affinity for like like masochism at this point, man. I mean, that's probably true. Like, between I, this, I've seen I've seen anime <laughs> much much worse than this. Oh, so God. anyway, I'm trying to get back to why specifically. Um, so on the one hand, it has the difficulty of as a film, it has to tell this long story that connects to Galgo, who, as we've all seen, is not an interesting character. In the TV series, he's almost never the main character of an episode. It's about someone hiring him for a reason. Mm. And that oh, person and their reason drives the plot. Like, yeah, that, that can actually work much better. Yeah, that, and that, they work out a little bit theoretically because work. other people, like, because of the structure of the film, they almost cut out entirely his usual structure where he gets hired by someone. Like, uh, he is hired to kill a Nazi. We never mm -hmm. meet the person who hires him. We're just told about that by someone else. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Leo? Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. I just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I thought that yeah, the gone. Nazi, I thought the Nazi was the guy that the bishop wanted dead. Is that no, no, wrong? No. The Nazi is Hughes, the guy in Hughes Tower, the impossible <sighs> shot he makes in America. The bishop <sighs> wants, uh, the woman dead. He wants the mafia leader dead. Who turns out. To oh, be dead. oh, okay. I got those mixed up. Sorry. Okay, Continue. So, um, yeah. So they structure it basically. He has a kill at the start of the movie. He has then two unrelated kills. But the kill of the start of the movie, the kill of Robert Dawson, the son of Leonard Dawson, is then what drives the big revenge plot by Leonard at the end of the movie as he uses all these resources to try and bring Galgo down. But one thing that I think it is better at than all the other Galgo work is as a work of anime. It is, it's much better animated. The TV series had a very low budget. It looked it. The OVA, a modest budget. But this is um, one of the greatest, or anyway, the most influential directors of anime, Osamu Tezaki, using a lot of his distinctive styles in this film. He'd also be known for something like Rose of Versailles, where he essentially created the language of shoujo anime with all the flowers. And here we see one of his most distinctive um, things uh, used repeatedly in the film, which is the postcard memory. Whenever the frame freezes and you see a more detailed drawing of something, that was Dezaki's idea. He came up with it. It's been repeated and parodied very often in anime. A lot of other different um, influences here we can see, like with the bad guys, their disgusting habits, their kind of subversive, perverse behavior. They seem like a rough draft of the kind of characters who populate every single thing Yoshiaki Kawajiri of Ninja Scroll fame ever made. You know? And yeah. but the visuals, like when he's setting in, assembling his gun, fighting the target, mm -hmm. that quiet moment where he just lets out a single breath. Or when he's in the car and the lights are the neon lights are just strobing all over him. It's just more interesting. That was nice an incredibly yeah. bland mm -hmm. look. Believe me, bland look of everything else related to Gogo 13. You know, well, you I, I, well, I thought where uh, at the end of the movie, Leonard you made Dawson. me want to appreciate this movie more. Actually, no, <laughs> yes. I would like to. Okay, pull back from just the set, the plot, and the character, and say that yeah. uh, visually, it's a pretty damn impressive film. Like this is one of the prettier '80s anime that I think I've seen. You know, just I just you, you know, like like you said, the. Uh, when he lines up his shot, that's just great. And the little moments of silence uh, in between the clicking, that was great too. Like that, that part I could appreciate, but it was, it, I just felt it was too bad that it was framed around this unlikable character and plot that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Very I mean, stylistically. Male, very male very, very big male fantasy stuff going on here, you know? It's, yeah, the so. movie is basically pornography. It's different kinds of yeah. pornography. It's masculinity Absolutely. porn, it's gun porn, it's violence mm -hmm. porn, and then just regular there's, softcore porn. There's the porn porn part. Yeah. There's yeah. a yeah, lot of porn porn. Oh, Also, one point I want to make. This is the first time I've seen the movie since the death of Uzama Dazaki. He died in 2011. And he died of lung cancer because he was a heavy smoker. So that really put in context how often people smoke in this movie. Because they're always <laughs> breaking out cigarettes. Like Golgo yeah. 13 is a yeah, chain smoker. Right. In fact, right. the only thing Golgo 13 puts to his mouth is cigarettes. You know? But it is, it is a more stylistically interesting movie than I anticipated going in, which I appreciated. Um, there's a nice scene, um, where he's making, he's in San Francisco making a really long sh uh, sniper shot into this penthouse and the he's like on a like an animated beer sign mm -hmm. and that kind of reminded me of the scene a little bit 
tangentially, in Skyfall, where the big billboard oh, yes, yes. wedding him. Yeah. That was mm-hmm. a nice sequence. Um, Will already mentioned the scene where he's, he's driving and all the lights are strobing over his car. That was really neat. There are a lot of individually neat scenes and visual moments in this movie, um, and I can't appreciate it on that level. But yeah, I just wish it was tied around something more interesting because I did my my other big problem with the movie was just structural. Um, there's not really a lot of highs and lows to this movie. It's thing happens, thing happens, thing happens, things. There's not really. It's weirdly episodic. Yeah, there's really yeah. not a. Yeah. It needs to be a little, t- uh, you know, tighter in terms of because it things rev up a little bit once you find out like the motivations behind Dawson and things like that. Um, but it's just, it, yeah, it's just this kind of series of things happening. There's yeah. really not, there's not like an arc to it. Um, and that makes it a little tedious. And I guess the other thing is there's, there's too many sequences where, cause even an octopusy, even if the things he does like hiding in an ape seat are dorky, <laughs> he, he does something that's clever to get out of the situation. There are too many scenes in Golgo where he doesn't do anything, but he gets out anyway. Yeah. That's that's what annoyed me. Like there's a scene uh early in the movie. He's a very his car very is on passive protagonist. Yeah, his car yeah. is on a beach yeah. and the mafia surrounds his car and reels it with bullets and it explodes. And we don't we don't even see him get out of the car or anything. They just yeah. riddle it with bullets, car explodes, and then we see him swimming away. Like, oh, nothing. gosh. You he know what do- really annoyed me about that scene, too? Just on a, like, they have a moment where they're, like, waiting. Okay, wait for him to get in the car. Why? <laughs> Why did they wait until he was in the car? Yeah, yeah I mean, and that's yeah. one of that. There's I mean, another he's sequence. He's more yeah, vulnerable it's, before he gets in the car. Like, it's yeah, an impossible he's, shot. Why did yes. they wait for him? to get up to try and make the shot. I mean, they actually know where he is. There's a guy who's yeah. right behind him saying, I got Golgo. Now, if yes. they were acting as normal police and they're waiting for him to do something that looks illegal, that makes sense. But so we subsequently learn they've been corralled by Leonard Dawson's campaign to get rid of Golgo by any means necessary. So right. why they don't take him out immediately is not clear. Yeah. Or there's like I mean, another scene. We are talking about a guy who apparently ordered a hit on John F. Kennedy. So. Yeah. Yes. I love how you still throws music, that out as, as like a punchline, you know? The business oh in Dallas. God. I think my favorite part about that whole scene is they're like, now taking down the president. That was that was just for the country's Yeah, yeah. We gotta draw the line somewhere. Yeah. But we have to draw the line at getting the Gogol guys, this is just so far. This single assassin is serious business. This time, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not even Gogol they're objecting to. They're objecting to getting gold and silver out of prison. So they're oh. building up his opponents so bad that getting them out of prison is worse than killing the president. I just want to point <laughs> out that the that element of conspiracy added to history is actually quite common in the Golgo story. In, in his long history in comics, he's uh, he actually. Honest to God, there's a plot where he shoots votes meant for Al Gore. What? <laughs> I'm not making that up. That was actually in one of the volumes that they published in English. I, I feel like I have to read that oh at some my point. God. Oh my God. I kind he of shoots of votes so meant for Al Gore. The, he's the Forrest Gump of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. It's, it's kind of a common tactic, a common narrative tactic to like to make your assassin character notable by tying them into history semi like... The Captain America movies, Winter Soldier, he mm. shot JFK, I think, Did if he? I remember correctly. No, I don't think so. He just kind of like this ghost that um, that's um, operating in the shadow of history. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, mean, but the, like, film, the film never actually mentions his name at all. And he does have a name. His name is Duke Togo. Oh. It's mentioned in other it's, films. No, I, yeah, it, it does mention him. Duke. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, she does she? Okay, she calls him Duke. Duke. Sorry. Yeah, she calls I was him thinking Duke. in the beginning where it's like name unknown. Yeah, his name is Duke Togo, but whether or not that name is an alias, it sounds like an alias, is never established. Over his long course in comics history, he has the longest-running comic in Japan, I think, or at least one of them. Definitely the longest-running sign since the 1960s. And they only announced this month that it's ending. And it's only beginning to end, but they don't have an end date. Anyway, in his long history, there have been many projected origins for Golgo. Never given by him, and all probably lies. He's just some guy who is presumably Japanese, who is really good at killing people. 
And that's it. My first time with an Asian. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I just stick that line in there. Yeah. But just to make absolutely clear, everyone gets that he's Asian. <laughs> yeah. He's probably Japanese. I mean, he could be Chinese. He's probably Japanese. Come on. You know? Yeah. Uh, Actually, that ties to another thing. I, I read this interesting comparison between him and Bond. Now, uh, before he created Galgo, Taco Saito had a very brief run writing Bond comics and actually drew Bond for the first time in decades to celebrate Spectre. I'll link that to you later. But um, one of the key differences is Bond is an agent of the government, which is kind of a believable fantasy for Britain after World War II. The empire is over, but Britain can still pretend through its individual operatives it has a kind of power in the world. They no longer rule India, but a British man can still go to India and get the job done and also have a lot of support from uh, local British and Indian forces. But Japan's empire was completely destroyed. Its place in the world distinctly separated from the entire shady um, spy world. So Galgo is detached from Japan nationally so he can still operate in this world. He has to be for the, for the fantasy to feel real, essentially. Right. Well, there's another link between Bond and Golgo 13 that occurred to me. Um, if you think about it, Golgo 13, uh, he is intimidating, he doesn't talk much, he's violent, and he kills whoever pays him. So he's basically a Bond henchman. This Golgo 13 is the story of, like, odd job or something, where he is the hero. <laughs> That's, I, I didn't think about that. Maybe, maybe someday we'll get a mashup. James Bond versus Golgo. Yeah, actually, that's really a good point because that would explain why Golgo's villains have to be much worse than Bond's. Like uh, mm-hmm. Snake, Gold, and uh. Silver are the only people who can oppose him. And while Golgo is like this perfect rock solid masculinity, they're like a perversion of it. You know, they're like disgusting and lecherous and vile well, and yeah. uh, lavicious. Well, just... Okay, so am I wrong? In... Okay, I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure Snake wasn't taken down. By Gogol, right? No, he was shot he, by a helicopter. Exactly, yeah. and Gogol just somehow managed to escape yeah. that as well in the elevator, right? Mm-hmm. So, so he's so bad that some other baddie had to take him down. I yeah. find that intriguing. Also, okay. it's funny how we they were they were trumping up gold and silver, and gold and silver went down real easy compared to uh, Snake, yeah. the Snake. Or what? What was he called? Just the snake Just or snake. Snake? The snake? The snake. Yeah. Snake. The snake doesn't really have a backstory either. He's just kind of this guy that they have. He's just he's just killer croc for Batman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we've reached the topic of snake. So let's uh, go uh, on to the next thing about snake. And oh, um, uh, that's, that's subplot. Um. Okay. So oh, what's his right? Name? Yeah. Yes. The uh the guy that Golga thirteen killed at the beginning. Leonard Dawson. Yeah. Leonard Dawson, son yeah, yeah. of Robert. Leonard, yeah. You know, uh, Robert Other Dawson around. he kills. Leonard Dawson is the father. Oh. And the person we're about to discuss is Laura. Mm. Laura. Yes, Laura. the widow of the dead guy. Who um what's what's his name? The billionaire guy. Leonard gives, Dawson. Leonard Dawson, okay. Leonard Dawson gives his daughter in law as payment to Snake. <sighs> and, of course, he rapes her. <laughs> so many sighs. <laughs> and then, he rapes her. She's she's not into this whole using my oh, body. Oh, not into it. Yeah, <laughs> she's, she's just totally not into it, guys. Yeah, she, I don't get it. <laughs> not, not yet. Yep. Because by the end, we discover that um, she has become a hooker. That rape has turned her into a streetwalker. Oh. Uh. <laughs> so, two rape yep. sequences, guys. Two. 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 two long rape sequences. That was necessary. The shower. Uh. <laughs> and and she like she's angry at Golgo because it's his fault this happened to her indirectly. And she like fires at him and he just like eh. <laughs> Walks off. That, that's an interesting <laughs> thing is that, um, you know, he lets her take the shot. He sees the gun. He could have stopped her, but he just ignores it. Mm-hmm. I know. I find that worse. <laughs> Did he even <laughs> recognize her? Or was he like, oh, it's okay. It, it's, I think it, that it's he not whether or not he her. recognizes her. He sees that she's pointing a gun at him. So it doesn't matter if he recognizes her or not. 
I think you. I think he was like, ah, she's kind of got a point. She wants to do it, then I'll. Yeah. I'll give her I was one. So angry by the end. You know, I, I'm sure I was kind of dickish to her. My theory is that it was like Olga was like, oh, it's a woman. Who cares about that? And just walks away. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, he, he kills women. He kills women. We saw that earlier in the movie. Yeah, but yeah, but only, but only when they're the head of mafia gangs. You know, it's it's point. different if they're and, and that, that's a related women. point. Um, although it's not explicit and it doesn't, it's not suggested deliberately, he only winds up killing people for good reasons. I yeah. mean, he kills a Nazi because a survivor of the Holocaust wants that person dead. He kills a mafia person who's been, and he's hired to do that by a bishop. And he finally essentially lets someone commit suicide. The most morally questionable thing he does is assisted suicide in terms of his targets. What? Like when a kid shoots shoot at him, he doesn't. The beginning do? What? Dude! What? What did Leonard, the first person he kills, like the very first? No, he kills Robert Dawson. Um, I thought Robert by the Robert of... Dawson to kill Robert Dawson. Wait. Leonard is the father. No, the very first person he killed was that uh, was, was the Robert opening Dawson. sequence, right? No, yeah. no, no. It was the opening sequence before that, uh, before the title. Oh, yeah, the person yeah, that was like standing. The at very a... first oh, person that's... he kills is Robert Dawson. Okay. I thought that was. The I, I thought. Well, I thought Robert was the bad guy and Leonard was the one who no. shoots the guy. Uh, no, 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 no. I said this Robert. a couple of times. Leonard is the bad guy. Okay. No, but Robert, so what did Robert do? He did wanted Robert? to commit suicide and yeah. so hired a dude to do it okay. for him. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's explained okay. when Leonard is dropping to his death. You hear Robert's um, death confession note he left for his father. So he actually told Leonard that he hired Golgo. Which is why Leonard is so obsessed with getting Golgo and not the person who was hired to kill his son. I just don't hired. understand why he didn't tell Laura. Like, he will let Laura be raped by Snake, but oh my god, bridge too far to say that your husband wanted to commit suicide. Dude. He's not a good person, <laughs> is my takeaway there. He doesn't deal with grief well. Okay, the, the end he game doesn't aside. Deal with, like, deal with grief well. But my point is, is that none of the people, the most morally questionable thing he does is the assisted suicide of Robert Dawson. Okay, the, the end game revelation of that aside, of that aside though, like the, that opening of just this person who we don't know if they've done anything wrong, they're just talking at a podium and he mm -hmm. assassinates him with a sniper rifle. That left a poor impression of me on Google. Exactly. And Golgo. Yeah. Uh, the, the eventual the twist, Golgo was, in, Golgo was in the other movie. But the eventual twist is, you know, that he was right. justified. Although, uh, a note, because I want to say this at some point, his, um, his code name, Golgo 13, Golgo is short for Golgotha, as in where Jesus was crucified. And that's why the intro sequence of the film has, uh, in some versions, has a, a skeleton with a, a crown of thorns, which is, for some reason, his calling card. It was a pretty, pretty great opening. Those, those headless, we want to talk about openings. It was better than Octopussies by far. Those, those headless yeah. skeletons with handguns. I actually, All -time I actually high, you guys. paid attention and, to that yeah, one. Yeah, the music was better. <laughs> it looked right. pretty yeah. and the music was good. Oh yeah. yeah. That is another reason why I chose like, it. That's the best, that is the best Golgo 13 opening. I mean, yeah. the opening for the TV series was, you know, very modern J-Rock, kind of angsty. And the very idea of having angsty that, music right? over uh, Golgo uh, seemed to defeat the entire point, you know. I mean, right. This man does not axe. No. Ever. He needs, he needs headless skeletons with tangons. I will exactly. I will go for that every time. I find myself more drawn to angst often. <laughs> but fair enough. Well, I mean, you can't have an angsty character. It's just not wrong. It's wrong for the character, is my point. Okay. I mean, it's not like it's a bad yeah. song. It's just wrong. Mm. Uh, that's fair. Go. Well, okay, so going back into this whole rape business, because I, I feel like I need to <laughs> right. visit that. Yeah, we, we need <laughs> to pick on Gar. Rape. No, no, yeah, go okay. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One thing I want to say is that it's another way that, you know, Golgo women want him, but his enemies who are perverts, they need to take them. Not only do we have these two rapes, but gold, gold and silver uh, were imprisoned for unspecified and apparently sexual crimes. So, oh, was it sexual? Yeah. Oh, I didn't I realize that. I think it was that. sexual. Yeah. I am honestly, I don't know if they I just said perverse it. crimes. Perverse, perverse. that was it. I, I definitely heard the word perverse being thrown around. So the, Make up yeah. it's perverse. It was oh, I thought it was just like torturing people. Mm. But anyway, you were saying about, um, but let's get back to the, the right. Okay, so the um sequence of a, um, of a, of a widow, a rape victim turning into a hooker, it makes a certain kind of logical sense if you divide women into virgins or whores that um, yep. either they are pure or they are beyond the pale. Even if they cross that line through no fault of their own, they are used goods, they are no longer any good, 
they're just hookers now. They are sluts. They're yeah. all which, hookers. Now. Which interestingly oh, is not okay. how the film handles any of its other women. Like Rita is definitely a hero all the way through. I don't know. Rita, Rita kind of like um. Well, okay, but Rita. I'm not okay, saying like so they're Rita, I'm saying they're not. Rita is a hero. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, but yeah. but uh, the the whole thing the women are becoming. I mean, it was clearly like. I mean, Rita when she has sex, it's pure. She's doing it out of love. Uh, Laura is raped. It's yeah. she has been perverted by the the evil touch of snakes. So she 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 like yes, like Sarah said, she's damaged good. She can't she can't have pure uh sex anymore uh because she has tasted of the bad. I guess so. I I mean like I was thinking at the end too. Uh, she clearly got a pretty good settlement from um from her father in law because he says he's gonna cut her a check to leave. Um, and yet she's still out on the street hooking because what what else can she do now with her life? You know, she's it's been even explicitly yeah. mentioned. She says that she can she has change for a hundred dollar bills. You know. Yeah, yeah. So she's not just hooking. Apparently, you would get um money for it in the process. So it's just complete it's be- yeah it's it's complete she she has been undone forever and that i don't know that that left a disgusting taste in my mouth guys <laughs> yeah. Mm, <definitely. laughs> but yeah as far as girl go 13 the character goes like why does he even have sex with him and they don't seem like he enjoys it it's like is this just like him pretending to be human that oh yes men are supposed I, to i have think sex. it's because he's such an embodiment of stoicism he never lets any emotions show I mean, we almost get an impression that he likes Rita because he says, you know, he pays her, but he pays her specifically for her work. And he tells her to get out of town. This is the closest we ever see him yeah. to expressing some kind of emotion. I mean, you know? I think you could view it as like a completely utilitarian thing. Actually, you know what? True. Like, gotta, oh, you know, yeah. that's, it's like, oh, I gotta get the stress point. out like, every once in a while. I gotta get it out. And, yeah, I gotta. You know. Damn it. I'm I'm turned on again. Got to go to the lawn that rides over me. Yeah, I go get my cork pot. He's got a lot, he's got a lot of history might be as well. for murder, but sometimes I need to get, need to get off. off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, you know. Although that uh, one guy, he did say Golgo was frightened, which um, I don't even know yeah. how he knew that because how could you tell? I think it's because he knew <laughs> Golgo you... that well. Because it's not possibly... that Golgo doesn't feel emotions. It's Golgo for whatever reason has decided to never them, show. You know? Any emotions. The but this guy, he's, this he's a contact for Golgo. He's worked with him before, so he's able to read him better than most people. So Golgo can not... feel fear, but his expression when feeling fear is exactly the same as when he's sniping with his improbable M16 I sniper know, rifle, that... which is not a thing. <laughs> yes. Someone had to say it. M16 sniper rifle, yes. It's, it's not a thing. That's actually when, when Golgo is parodies an enemy, and he's parodied a lot, that comes up a lot. <laughs> Oh, the like, impossible gun? Yeah, that, yeah there's the no way you can shoot like that. I mean, he doesn't even use an actual sniper rifle. He's so badass, he uses a regular rifle. A customized oh, is that, oh, regular rifle, yeah. It's is not that what it is? Okay, good to know, gun guys, because I, I didn't get why that was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought oh, it yeah. looked silly. That's not how it goes. I didn't know for uh, That gun looked awfully not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. To be honest, I, I didn't know at the time, and I didn't notice it until anime started to make fun of it. Ah, okay. okay. Putting my cards on the table there. Oh, well, I'm... I only know this because I watched um, a Ben Obashi, Magical Shopping at Ben Obashi, which is a very funny Golgo 13 parody. And it was a good series in general. It was made by the people who did Fully Cooley. Oh. Ooh. Fun fact. Yeah. So, gents and dames, would, would you recommend Golgo 13 or Octopussy? I would recommend Octopus neither. Is a big no. <laughs> big um, no. Uh, I'm okay. I'm kind of torn with Gogol 13 only because uh, stylistically it's pretty sweet. But if you are looking for a good tail or a cool guy, I don't know. I would say no. <laughs> the action did impress me enough. And there's just too much grossness in it for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I think one very important point in comparing the two is that Gogo 13 is half an hour shorter. Mm. Oh, so yeah, there we go. It it's a wrong. solid 40 minutes shorter. A, so if 40 yeah, minutes shorter, even better. Yeah. If yeah, don't yeah. want any, though. It's yeah. an hour and a half of, of yeah. Like, Octopussy has a huge pacing problem and has an ending that is interminable. Gogo 13 at least moves pretty quickly. Sure. Well, 
Okay, so Golga 13, I think, is important historically. I'm not really sure I would recommend it to anyone. But if they kind of want to see what was the high end of anime, I mean, it even has CGI in 1983, which is crazy. It's the fr- I've, I'm pretty sure I wasn't able to find an exact confirmation, but it does appear to be the first or one of the very first anime to have CGI in any capacity. And if you want like a demonstration of like the nature of the OVAs that are coming out at that time, like the content levels and everything, this well, is they certainly were a little later. Oh, they, they were yeah. uh, 1988 and onwards. This certainly so come this but okay late like 80s that. anyway. But this but like, it was a big influence on them. Yeah, like uh, this, Yoshiaki Kawajiri of Ninja Scroll fame. It's just like yeah, know, content wise, this one definitely reminded me of all that, and it's. I can say at the very least, it's certainly better than the likes of Oh yeah, Mad Dog eighty four, Angel oh, God, God. etc. You know, it, Mad Bull it did remind Mad me Bull. of speaking of Bull, Toro. It did actually remind me like of. of uh, now that I think about it, it Go did ahead. give me some uh, bad Ninja Scroll flashbacks. Some of yeah. it, that, particularly clear, the saying. vileness of the villains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't mm-hmm. that doesn't yeah. help. I'm bad. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think um, while there's probably better Dazaki anime, <laughs> Dazaki himself is worth looking at as an anime director because of his influence on so much. Like even if you've ever seen in any series when someone dies and it kind of whiteouts, and you see a white etch of their the character. That's a reference to Ashida mm-hmm. no Jo, which was one of his first big works in the 1970s. So obviously there's nothing like that in Golgo, but Golgo in certain terms of style is a good example of some of the things that made him one of the most uh, influential directors in Japan in animation. I would be interested to look into his other works. I'll be sure yeah, to. Yeah. And I definitely, really, I'm most interested in Rosa Versailles from what yeah. I know. That one's we really should good. do Rosa yeah. Versailles at some point. In yeah. fact, like, yeah, yeah, really. random, random idea I want to pitch. Rosa Versailles, I've heard things called... about that one. In fact, it would be cool to do that at some yeah, point. Yeah. There's like a, a TV series that uh, Canal Plus made called Versailles. So that Versailles, this Versailles, hmm. I don't know. Ooh, it's not about the revolution, unfortunately. That. There's obviously a lot of stuff about the revolution. This is actually about the Sun King when he was a young man. Ooh. Oh. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That sounds... That, actually, that, that sounds, sounds more intriguing to me than uh, the uh, revolution yeah. because I've seen so much crap about the revolution, but the Sun but do King... Do you think we, we should do, like, something about the Sun King and then Rose of Versailles? Or Rose of Versailles kind of like a sequel to it? Yeah, basically. It's like yeah, a, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Before okay. the revolution and after Ooh. the revolution. Okay, add nice. That, I'm down with add that. Add that to the list. <laughs> add it yeah. to the list. Stenographer that okay. we have. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, sweet cheeks. Add it to the list. Money penny. So, are, are we um are we done? Are we ready to tell people what our next thing is? Yeah. Sure. sure. Okay. So um the next podcast we are recording is about something I'm sure you've never heard a podcast about before. Puella Magi Madoka Magica. That's right. A very obscure, enormously popular anime about magical girls. But we will be comparing it to the 19... Sorry, to the 2012 film Chronicle. So we'll be looking at these somewhat subversive takes on magical girls and superheroes together and seeing what, you know, connections we're able to draw. Now with that, I am William. I'm Amber. I'm Dylan. I'm Jesse. I'm Tom. Good night and good luck, you filthy animals. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> so, hello, uh, Podcastle fans, all God knows how many of you, four. Um, this is Dylan, and I just um, thought that there was something I should clarify for all of you in regards to how the other podcasters will refer to me from now on, and in regards to my absence during the long hiatus while we were trying to get episode three out um i <clears throat> came out as transgender and so the other podcasters will now be referring to me as she her so just just so you understand that for future reference okay <laughs>